morning, church family. There are many ways to be involved here at Hickory Grove, and here are a few things coming up. Today, we're emphasizing together on mission. We want you to be thinking about who's your one? Who's that person you can be praying for and inviting to church with you on Easter Sunday? You can also learn more about other outreach opportunities like Hearts and Hammers, our clothes closet, our food pantry in the lobby after the service. In partnership with Baptist Children's Home, we'll be offering foster and respite care training classes at our Mallard Creek campus. If you're interested, there will be four classes beginning Saturday, April 15th, and you must attend all four classes in order to receive your license. This Wednesday, we'll begin a new foundation series. At our Harris campus, Pastor Clint will be teaching on some of the tough topics of theology. He'll address questions like, is the Bible reliable? And the science disprove Christianity. At our Mallard Creek campus, Pastor Kyler will be covering the major world religions. He'll look through the lens of history at Judaism, Islam, Hinduism, and Buddhism. We hope to see you on Wednesday night. We're so glad you're here with us today on this Lord's Day. Now let's get ready to worship together. Let's all stand as we sing together this morning. We worship a risen Savior. Death could not defeat him. The grave could not hold him. He is alive. He's worthy of our praise this morning. Let's sing this together. Risen, he's risen forever.
He is alive. That's the Savior that we worship this morning. We want to welcome you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And if you are new or visiting with us this morning, we welcome you as well in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. May you find a great joy as we worship together and lift up the name of the Lord as a body of Christ. And at the end of our service, please stop by in the lobby. Our pastors would love to meet you and to connect with you. Now, Psalm 43, verse 5, listen to what the Psalms write. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. This morning we are reminded that in deep despair, we are to joyfully praise God. For he is our help and he is our salvation. There is no circumstances in our lives or any situation too difficult to be brought before our God. We can rest on his promise, for he is in control, and he is again our salvation. Let's pray. Father God, we lift up your name this morning. May the sorrowful find comfort. May the weary find rest. May the doubting find faith through Christ Jesus, him alone. So help us as we worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's continue to lift up the name of our Lord as we sing.
all sing this out as we talk about the hope that we have in Christ. Lord, from sorrows deep I call When my hope is shaken Torn and ruined from the fall Hear my desperation For so long I've pled and prayed God, come to my rescue Even so the thorn remains Still my heart will praise you. Storms within my troubled soul, questions without answers. On my faith these rivers roll. God be now my shelter. Why are you cast down my soul? Let me invite you to be seated. You know, one of the things that unifies us as followers of Christ is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And also one of those things that unites us is mission, is being on mission. That we don't just keep the gospel to ourselves, we want to give it to other people. It's one of the things that brings us together. Now, you may be aware that we've been talking about being uh, together today in the next couple of weeks leading up to Easter. And today we want to focus on being together on mission. Now, you might be familiar with several of the missions, that, uh, the ministries that we have that are local missions right here, things like Hearts and Hammers. Uh, we have men that go out just about every single week, just about every single day of every week, uh, building uh, wheelchair ramps and porches for uh, those in our community with the hope of sharing the gospel with them. And also our food pantry every Tuesday from about 250 to 300 families right here in our community. We're able to meet tangible needs, but then also have opportunities to pray for them, invite them to church, and to share the gospel. 
Also, our closed closet ministry uh, meets several times a year, and we're able to meet uh, needs right here in the community to be able to clothe those right here in our community and then invite them to church and share the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is all about being together on mission. But instead of taking my word for it, let's listen to a couple of our members and how these ministries have impacted our life. Take a look at the screens. I am serving in with Present Age Ministries, which works with um, young girls who have been victims of human trafficking. I also serve with Closed Closet. I have the pleasure of being able to serve in the Closed Closet um, and at the Food Pantry. You know, I've served in other areas, singing and that kind of thing, but I wanted to do something a little more to give back to our community. I learned about Present Age Ministries about a year ago at Girls' Night Out, and so I went to the training and in the midst of that, I realized that God was speaking to me about that. And it was time to really stretch my comfort zone. It's a neat relationship you can build with the people who come, because a lot of them are the same people. And you get to know them, and you get to know what they're going through. You know, it's, it's nice for them to come through the line and say, hey, I'm, I'm struggling, I'm having you know, an issue with this or that, you know, and would you please pray for me? So really, it's about showing them what family really means according to the gospel, what love really means according to the gospel. And it means just showing up for them, being there for them. Um, it can show up in different ways. In some cases, it may be as simple as taking a girl out for a cup of coffee and just being there listening to her, helping her with her homework. This ministry is not only giving them food, but we're also reaching families and we're bringing them into our church. I've seen children that I've seen in the food pantry line come through church on Wednesday nights for Awana. So I think that's a really neat thing that we can minister to them, not just for food, but you know, for their souls. You know, we, we don't know what the needs are represented by the different people who come in. And so just, you know, smiling, you know, even if we have a language barrier, a smile breaks the language barrier. We need a lot of people to run these ministries. Today, when I serve, we, we weren't sure if we were gonna have enough people to, to hand out food. If you're thinking about it, we could use you. Just get out there and do something. Find some area that you can put your hands to. We're allowing God to use us. God allows us to be part of His work here on earth, and that's a blessing to us even. The Lord can use you more than us. Esther was told we are here for such a time as this. I'm gonna quote Miss Judavine who said, we need a lot more people to help us in these ministries. And so that's where you come in today, is to begin praying about how you can be together on mission uh, in these ministries right here at our church. But more specifically, right after the service, uh, you're gonna have an opportunity to be able to sign up to volunteer and to serve in these ministries. Uh, if you have your worship guide, you can see several ministries and additional ministries where you can be involved to use the, the gifts and talents that God has given you than to uh, be able to share the gospel. That's what we need you to do. So pray about that, and then after the service, we hope many of you will stop by the tables in the lobby and to sign up to be together on mission. Now let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask that he would raise up an army right here at Hickory Grove to share the gospel with our community. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness and how good you are to us by giving us your son, Jesus. God, it unifies us and brings us together from every person in this room, from different backgrounds. It is what unites us. And so, Father, I pray that mission and taking the gospel to our community would unite us as well. God, I pray that you would call men and women that are right here this morning who maybe have been on the fence or sitting on the sidelines that it's their time to get involved. God, I pray that you will help us to take the gospel through these ministries to the people in our community, our neighbors and our friends and our families and people right across the street here from Hickory Grove Baptist Church. God, would you use us to be together on mission? God, you've called us to be salt and light to our community. And God, I pray that we would do that to bring honor to you. Just as you sent Jesus into the world, God, you send us out every week to be together on mission to share the love of Christ. God, help us to do that this week. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Church, would you stand as we continue to sing to our Lord?
Let's pray together. Father, we rejoice in the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ. A man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, crowned with thorns, but now highly exalted, adorned with glory. Thanks be to God. His death is our life, his resurrection our peace. So we thank you, Lord. Holy Spirit, would you open our heart, mind, 
Make our ear attentive to your word and make us like Jesus Christ. In his precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Olivia. As you're seated, let me invite you to open up your Bibles to Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2 is where we'll be this morning. We'll start in verse 18 and uh, read to verse 22. Mark chapter 2. As you're turning there, a couple of things I want you to be aware of. Next, next Sunday night, not this Sunday, next Sunday night at 6 o'clock, we'll have our spring night of worship, and it will be a great night. I hope you'll go ahead and mark your calendar and uh, be here for that. Even though we don't normally gather, that is a really great time to center our minds on Christ. And as a part of your admission, we're asking that everybody bring um, a sock donation. Sock, like what you wear on your feet, socks, not, not socks you have on now, but socks, you can brand, brand new socks. Uh, bring them here for Ecuador. Have want to support our Ecuador mission, um, the mission teams that are going there, and One Heart Global Ministries. And uh, you probably have heard on the news there was an earthquake yesterday or the day before in Ecuador. I talked to Katia Aguirre, who runs One Heart, and she's asked us to pray for them. Uh, their facility is okay, and nobody close to them has been killed, but there are, have been several deaths there in Ecuador, and uh, they, they will be doing ministry. We want to support them. So Sunday night, night of worship, 6 o'clock here. It'll be a great night. Bring some socks. I was told to tell you don't bring a bunch of tube socks. Bring socks for children uh, and adults. All right. And also, I personally wanted you to be aware of the card that you saw in your seat. When you came in, there was a card there in your seat. It is the Who is Your One card. On this side, you'll see, on the light side, you'll see Who's Your One. I want you to write somebody's name down in that blank there. Write somebody's name down, and on the other side, you see how you can pray for this person. I want this to be somebody that you know that uh, you hopefully can bring maybe Easter Sunday or you can start, maybe it's just you start praying for them and looking for an opportunity to share Christ. We want to be very intentional in what we do and take this card, write that person's name down, put it in your Bible so you can get to it and pray for them often and ask God to uh, give you a chance to share the gospel. Now, if you're not sure on how to do that, we have lots of resources in the lobby, a whole lot that you can choose from, pick up, it's all of yours, take it as you go, and hopefully it'll be helpful for you as we head toward Easter Sunday morning. All right, enough of that talk. Let's go to the Bible. If you found Mark chapter 2, why don't you stand and read together God's Word. <clears throat> Mark chapter 2, we'll start in verse 18 and read to verse 22. Grass withers and the flowers fade, but the Word of our God stands forever. Let's begin verse 18. <clears throat> Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. People came and said to him, Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guest fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. No one sews a piece of unsh unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear is made. No one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins. The wine is destroyed, and so are the skins. But new wine is for fresh wineskins. Let's pray. Father, I ask in the name of Jesus that you would bring healing and hope, that you would remove bitterness. Father, I pray that all of the wounds from the week that we've had would be healed by the gospel. I pray for all of your children that are struggling even today, maybe even to be here. Help them, Lord. Help us. God, I pray that you would make it so that what I say today would be right from the Bible, honoring to the Lord Jesus, good for your church, pointing us to the gospel. Help us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Don't forget, 
I have a silver band on my hand. It's beat up and ground down. In fact, it's broken right in the middle. And it says to me every time I look at it, don't forget. Some of you here in this congregation are old enough to have Super 8 movies for home movies. Your parents took it on a reel-to-reel, -reel, Super 8. Most of you, though, probably have home videos stored somewhere in a closet or up in the attic, and they're stacked there, almost forgotten, and they quietly whisper, don't forget. Every adult that I've known in the last 10 years or so that has gotten a tattoo, now I'm 54 years old, I'm past the time, gravity's getting hold, don't put a tattoo on you. <laughs> Some of you are still young enough. Every, every person that I've known that's an adult that's gotten a tattoo in the last 10 years has, it's either been a Bible verse or something to do with a family or both of them and it serves as a silent statement that says, don't forget. Even the church. For 2,000 years, the church has maintained a practice, the Lord's Supper, we'll do it today. A 2,000-year practice that is a tangible act that preaches a two-word sermon, don't forget. Don't forget the glad freedom you have in Christ. Don't forget the cost of your salvation. Don't forget that you are a new creation in Christ. All of those reminders are present in the story we just read. Let's get the setting right here in chapter 2. Jesus is in trouble again. You remember the times he got in trouble well, back in chapter 1 and 2? Jesus gets in trouble, first of all, when they bring the paralyzed man to him. They dig a hole in the roof, drop him down in front of Jesus. Jesus says, your sins are forgiven, heals the man. He gets in trouble for claiming to have the power to forgive sins. Pharisees didn't like that. Later on, he's walking by the Sea of Galilee, and there he calls Levi, whose name is Matthew. We have a gospel of Matthew. Levi is called to follow him. Math, uh, Levi is a tax collector. He's a sinner. He gets converted, follows Jesus. Levi is so glad, he throws a party, invites all of his friends, tax collectors and sinners. Jesus goes to the party, and the Pharisees see him sitting and eating with sinners. First, he claims to forgive sins. Now, he is eating with the sinners, what will he do next? Chapter 2, verse 18, where we just read, here's the third time Jesus is in trouble. This time, the Pharisees and even John the Baptist and his disciples, they're fasting. They are participating in this religious activity. There's a certain expectation. If you are devoted to God, this is what you will do. John the Baptist and his disciples are doing it. The Pharisees and their disciples are doing it, and people are wondering. The question on the table becomes, if you are so serious about God, why aren't you doing it? The question comes to him, and then what we're going to hear, you'll see it, what we're going to hear is Jesus opening up the windows of happiness and explaining what it actually means to be a bona fide citizen of the kingdom of God. And today, today I want the clouds to evaporate from your soul. I want it so that your heart can smile again. I want you to reflect on and remember the saturating love of God found in Jesus Christ. Most of all today, I want you to not forget. Don't forget how good it is to be in Christ. Don't forget. With that in mind, let's, uh, let's go to the story and consider what to remember. I'll give you a couple of things to remember. Here's the first one, number one. <clears throat> Don't forget joy. Don't forget joy. Don't forget what's happened in, in you. Verses 18 and 19, join me in the story. Let's get the context and hear what Jesus is saying. 
Let me read verse 18 and 19 with some comment. John's disciples, that's John the Baptist, he is an ascetic, that is to say he's out in the desert, he is preaching there, he's wearing the camel's hair and leather belt, he's eating locusts and wild honey from time to time, he's depriving himself, he's going without. Fasting is something he did. John and his disciples are fasting, and the Pharisees, the Pharisees that are the most religious, probably had a lot in common with Jesus theologically. They believed in God, they believed in the narrative of Scripture, they believed in resurrection. They should have been on his team. The religious leaders there, they're fasting. The Pharisees made it a part of their weekly routine. So John the Baptist and his disciples are fasting, the Pharisees are fasting, and they come and ask a question. Why aren't you? Now let's pause there and think about fasting for a moment before I go too far. <clears throat> the only regularly pr prescribed fast in the whole Old Testament was on the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement was the day when the animals would be sacrificed. Even the priest would have his sins atoned for. The people would be reminded of their sinfulness before God and God's good forgiveness. And, a, and fasting was going without food to display sorrow and contrition over sin personally and publicly. All of that accompanied repentance before God, a profound sorrow at your own sin against God. And over the course of time, the Pharisees picked it up and they started fasting as, as a part of their weekly routine. In fact, we find Luke 18, the Pharisee and the tax gatherer. Remember, they're up at the temple praying and uh, the Pharisee, remember his prayer? God, I thank you that I am not like other people. Which, by the way, if you're praying that right there, you're already in trouble. But this is what he says in his prayer. <clears throat> I tithe on everything I get and I fast twice a week. It was a way to show how serious you are. How serious you are about God, how sorry you are for your sin. John the Baptist he was doing it. His followers were doing it. And people are wondering, in verse 18, Jesus, if you are so serious about a holy God and the forgiveness of sins, why aren't you fasting? And in verse 19, Jesus introduces the illustration of a wedding feast. Now, before I read it, let me just give some background. In ancient Israel, a wedding feast is different than what we would understand as a wedding reception. Here we have a wedding. After the wedding, then you go to the reception afterwards. There you see the bridegroom and the bride, all of the family. Speeches might be made. It might be a really nice evening. I mean, Cotton and I got married. We uh, didn't have any money. So to have a wedding reception, we got married at our granddaddy's farm. Beautiful farmhouse, 2,500 acre dairy farm. It's a beautiful place. But we didn't have any money for a reception, so we got married on the front porch of the, of the farmhouse, and uh, the reception was in the yard. We borrowed a tent from Trustmark Bank, in Brookhaven, Mississippi, a big tent that everybody could be under on the very front Trustmark Bank, because that, that was our wedding tent. And under the tent, it had nuts, and I think there was some mints and a wedding cake. It was a nice reception, we had a good time, an hour and a half, and everybody's gone. Pretty basic reception. But even if the most elaborate reception, the thousands of dollars and a sit-down dinner with a steak meal, even the most elaborate reception in our day can't compare to the raucous wedding feast in Jesus' day. Wedding feast that might last the entire week. People there and music and food and wine and laughing. You might look forward all year long to the wedding feast. Jesus takes that idea here to verse 19 to explain. Verse 19, <clears throat> let me read it. <clears throat> Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. Now, Jesus is not condemning the practice of fasting. What he's saying is, it's not the right time. 
Jesus is the bridegroom. The people there and the people here, the wedding guest, in the presence of Jesus, this is a time for festivity. This is a time for joy. It's not the right time. You understand timing. Go to a funeral. You, typically, if you go to a funeral, you don't show up in a bathing suit. It's inappropriate. It's the wrong time. We haven't seen that yet. I'm sure John Harrell at some point in his career will see that. We've seen all kinds of things at funerals. But you don't show up like that. Wedding is the same way. You don't show up at a wedding thinking it's a funeral. Weddings are time for festivity, not for fasting. And Jesus said, the wedding guests have come. The bridegroom is here. I mean, throughout the Gospels, especially in Matthew, the kingdom of heaven is pictured as a wedding feast. All the way up to Revelation, Revelation 19, where we see the marriage supper of the Lamb. Even John the Baptist, when Jesus came, John the Baptist would say, he must become greater, I must become less. People wonder, are you jealous that people are going over there to him? And John says, you misunderstand, I'm the friend, I'm the friend of the bridegroom. The bridegroom is here, and if you're the friend of the bridegroom, you rejoice when you hear his voice. There's something, there is something exceptional and exciting about the ministry of the presence of Jesus. And the coming of Jesus into your life is a time of joy, not sorrow. Just like a wedding, the coming of Jesus is the beginning of a new relationship established with the people of God and established in Christ. Go with me in your mind through the Gospels to the crucifixion. Jesus crucified, dead, and buried. Three days. After the crucifixion, Jesus departed for three days. But at the resurrection, it's on Sunday, at the resurrection, his promise is to be with you. Remember Matthew 28, the Great Commission. Jesus is ascending into heaven. He tells his disciples as he goes, go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them all that I have told you, and I am with you to the end of the age. I want you to know the joy of being in the Lord. Philippians chapter 1, verse 25, Paul is talking to the church at Philippi, and he says, I, I, I see your progress in joy and faith. Joy in the Lord. We should have joy in worship. We gather together. You see it in the choir and the people on the stage here, the leading, and Olivier when he sings. You with your, a lot of you with your hands up. Joy. And what I'm reading in 2 Chronicles right now, my devotional life, and we're at, right at the end of 2 Chronicles. Judah is taken off and exiled. Before they go, there's one last really good king, Hezekiah. And Hezekiah restores the house of the Lord because there's joy there. We should have joy in your trial. I mean, I was reminded of that this week, to have joy in the middle of it. And Paul says the church of Philippi, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I'll tell you, rejoice. Let your forbearing spirit be made known to all people. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious for anything. By prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God and the peace of God. I want you to have the joy of knowing your sins. Look at me, if you're in Christ, your sins are forgiven. Don't forget how good it is to be in Christ. Don't forget joy. That's one thing to put on the shelf is keep moving through the text and find me there in verse 20, number 2. Don't forget the cost. Don't forget the cost. Verse 20, do you see it? In verse 20, Jesus brings up fasting again, and he brings up the appropriate time for fasting, and in so doing, he makes the very first reference. Verse 20 is the very first reference in the Gospel of Mark to his dying on the cross. Let me read verse 20. Join me there. The days will come, the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them. Then, they will fast on that day. The bridegroom, Jesus. The day will come when Jesus, the bridegroom, is. You see that phrase, 
taken away, you ought to circle it because that's the only time you'll ever see it in the New Testament. It feels like he's quoting Isaiah. He used it one time to talk about the death of the Son of Man as he pro prophesied it. it. It's like it's picked up here. The days will come when he's taken away. That phrase means to be violently, speaks to the violent nature of the cross. Jesus says, then, at the cross, when I'm taken away, then, fast when you think about that. In fact, this right here, this, this passage, if you come from a Catholic background or an Orthodox, Greek Orthodox or Eastern Orthodox or even a Russian Orthodox background, the practice of fasting in the week of, of going up to Lent, up to Easter, fasting on Wednesday and especially on Friday comes from this passage. The devout Catholics oftentimes would fast every Friday. That fast you wouldn't eat meat. You would eat fish, which they're right. It really isn't a meat. You wouldn't eat, wouldn't eat Meat would, would eat fish. It comes from this right here. This passage that speaks of fasting when the bridegroom is taken away. Fasting when you actually remember. When Christians face, fast now, Jesus said, when you do that in the Beatitudes, uh, comb your hair, wash your face, make it look like you were doing okay. That is something between you and God. And do that to remember. Remember the cost of your sin. Jesus didn't condemn the fasting. What he did was he put a personal devotion on it so that you and I might think about the, the depth of our sin and the cost of forgiveness. It's why we have our Good Friday service like we do. When you come to church on a Sunday morning, we want it to be a joyful experience because Sunday is a day of joy, it's a day of resurrection, when the body of Christ comes together, come through the doors. We have people there to greet you and shake hands. We not only want to be a, a, a friendly church, we want to be more than that. We're a joyful church. But there are days like Good Friday when the service will be different. You come in on the Good Friday service, we'll, we'll dwell on the heaviness and the somber nature of the cross. It'll feel differently. It's why we have the Lord's Supper. We'll take the Lord's Supper today. It's why we have the Lord's Supper, to, to meditate on the depth of our sin and the even deeper level of the goodness of God in forgiving our sin. His supreme act to purchase you. You were costly. Don't forget. Make it your own. I would write it like this. Don't forget, he took my place. Don't forget, Jesus suffered my sin. I heard Danny Aiken say it like this. Don't forget, God killed his son so he would not have to kill you. It's the explicit gospel. It's the gospel of the cross of Christ. I want to not only know it, I want to know how to explain it. I want you to know how to explain it. Here at Hickory Grove, we've borrowed an outline from a man named Greg Gilbert. It's a four-section outline. Four categories. If you want to write them down, I would write them down like this. God, man, Christ, response. We start with God always. You always start with God. The book starts with God. In the beginning was God. God is given to us in the Bible as a holy and just and loving creator. Holy, just, loving. God created man, the second category. God created man in his image. The reason you have dignity, the reason that I respect you, at least the basic reason, is that you are created in the image of God. You bear the image of God. That image of God in all of us, in me and you, that image has been messed up by sin, disfigured, I think is the best word, by sin. Remember, God is holy and he is just. Sin is a crime against God. It puts us in a bad situation. We are not just far from God. We have offended God and deserve his wrath. We are dead in sin. We've broken his law, and the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. God is holy, man is a sinner. But remember, God is not just holy, he's also loving. The third category is where Christianity is different from every other religion. 
Here, God shows his love in Christ. Christ is fully God and fully man. He had to be a man to save men and women. He came and did what we should have done, lived perfectly in perfect fellowship with God. He did that as our representative, fulfilled all the laws, didn't break one commandment, never failed a temptation. He was the perfect man, needed to live righteously because we couldn't. We go to the cross, and there we find the, the very center of Christianity. What happens at the cross? At the cross, where Jesus is nailed to the cross, there, that's when, that's when a man dies, wages of sin is death, and takes the punishment for mankind. Jesus dies on the cross. The wrath of God is poured out there, and the righteousness that he earned is available. So you have God, man, Christ. There's the gospel, the gospel presented to you. There's one more category. That category is faith. In order for the gospel to actually be yours, it's not just you showing up at church or doing religious things. It is you trusting that what Jesus did on the cross was sufficient for your sins. They are taken away. You are forgiven by God and accepted by the Father. I want you to think with me. Have you believed that? A lot of times in a church like ours, people will come and be baptized early on in life. And then as they grow in the middle school and high school, sometimes the, the ways of the world pull them in such a way that they just get lost there, off into college, and their life goes off the rails and not even sure if they really were a Christian or not. And something traumatic happens, and they sort of wake up from that and show back up at church. And it's confusing because you don't know, was it real? I'm asking you, have you put your faith? Do you trust that Jesus died for you? Look, if you do, don't forget. Don't forget how good it is to be in Christ. Don't forget joy. Don't forget the cost. Let's go one more round, verses 21 and 22. Don't forget the change, the change. That's how you know if something's happened, you've changed. Don't forget the change. To explain the difference between those who are in Christ and those who are not in Christ. In verse 21 and 22, Jesus uses twin parables, two parables that actually have the very same point. Let me read the first one, talk about it, and the second one, talk about it. And uh, let's explain what it means to be a new creation. Join me there in verse 21. <clears throat> verse 21, no one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear is made. You can't patch up, Jesus is saying, you can't patch up an old coat with a new patch that hasn't been weathered in some way, hadn't been through the wash at least once. You put that new patch on that old coat when it does finally go into the washing machine and then into the dryer, the patch is going to pull it away. In other words, the point is, it doesn't work. That's what the point of verse 21 is. You cannot just add Jesus to your life. Je Jesus cannot be just added or integrated into your existing lifestyle, and you just keep living like you were and put Jesus in there to somehow make you feel better. Jesus is not there as a patch to put over some anxiety or depression or hurt or bad feelings or anger that you have. Jesus isn't just a patch. Can't be attached to an otherwise unchanged way of living. Jesus is not a partial patching up of your life. He is a whole new robe of righteousness. What did Jesus say? Or what did Paul say in Romans 13, verse 13 and 14? Paul says, you know what, let us, walk, let us walk properly as in the daytime. Not in orgies and drunkenness and sexual immorality and debauchery and dissension and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus. Make no provision for the flesh. Or you might know 2 Corinthians 5, 21 better. For our sake, God, for our sake, he made him, Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin 
so that in him we might put on, become the righteousness of God. We don't place him as a patch over a little portion of our lives. We put him on as a covering. Second parable gives the same point. Second, join me there in the second one, verse 22. No one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins and the wine is destroyed and so are the skins, but new wine is for fresh wineskins. New wine, fresh wineskins. Wineskin is made out of a goat skin. Kill the goat, take the skin and tan the hide and as it's tanning, while it's still pliable, you could take the new wine, put it into the pliable goat skin so that as the wine fermented and the gases came up, the skin, the wine skin would expand with the wine and everybody would be okay. That's new wine into new wine skins. And what Jesus is saying, you can do that, but what you don't do is take new wine, who is Christ, and put it into an existing structure, life that you've got, you put it in there, that rigid old wine skin, you put in the new wine, when, when the gases come from all of the fermentation, it's going to expand and destroy it. And his point is, it doesn't work. You can't just put him into something that exists. There's a new creation. The Pharisees couldn't just take what Jesus is saying and stay what they're doing. He was the fulfillment. Paul writes in Ephesians 4, Verse 24, you are to put on, the, put on the new self after the likeness of God in righteousness and holiness. Colossians 3.10 says, we have put on a new self which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of the creator. Revelation chapter 21 verse 5, he who is seated on the throne said, behold, I am making all things new. You hear it in our baptism. We baptize someone, we say, buried with him in baptism, raised to walk in new life. When we take the Lord's Supper today, you'll hear me quote the words of Jesus when he says, this cup is a new covenant. And in this fog, look, in the fog of life, and the tiredness of a tough week. Don't forget how good it is to be in Christ. Don't forget the joy, the joy, the joy of the Lord. Don't forget the cost. We'll focus on that, the Lord's Supper. Don't forget the change. Is that change yours? It can be today if you will turn from your sin and by faith turn to Christ. As we prepare to take the Lord's Supper, why don't you pray with me? Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray that you help us. For all of those that are not in Christ, may today be a reminder. And, and would you create a desire to come to Jesus? For all of those that are in Christ and have struggled this week, God, would you make this a time of remembering? Help us to not forget. In Jesus' name, amen. Here at Hickory Grove, we do so many things that are mission-focused, outward-focused. There are just a couple of things that we do here that are inside the family. If you saw the body of Christ as a house, the front door to that house would be baptism. That's how you enter the family meal inside of that house would be the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is for those that have been changed, put your faith in Christ and been baptized, you've come in, and you're a part of the family, you take the meal. So for any of you that are in Christ, we would invite you to take the Lord's Supper today. If you, however, have questions of that, you're not sure, maybe refrain from that and talk to one of the pastors afterwards. This is a tangible reminder of those who are in Christ and those who are not. If you have children that have never put their faith in Jesus, never been baptized, this is a good time. It's a great 
tool for teaching. When you ride home today and you say, well, how come, how come I couldn't take the Lord's Supper? You can then explain the gospel in those four categories we talked about. If you had the elements, I would invite you to open it up. Take the top there where the wafer is and gently pull that off the lid. And just pull the wafer out and then turn it over and gently remove the covering from where the grape juice is. The Bible says that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body. It's given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. <clears throat> the Bible says that in the same way after supper, Jesus took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant which is given in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The Apostle Paul will go on to say that as often as you eat the bread and take the cup, you have proclaimed, you've preached, you've said, Jesus saved. You've proclaimed the Lord's death until he comes. This morning, if you were here and you were unable to take the Lord's Supper for any reason, you'd like somebody to pray with you, we're going to have one last worship song. I would invite you to come forward, and a pastor will pray with you if you'd like to come and pray here. Maybe you'd like to just, after writing that person's name down, you want to come and pray for your one. Or if you'd like to talk about what it means to give your life to Jesus, you weren't able to take the Lord's Supper, but you want to. You want to be in Christ. This morning when we sing, we'll invite you to come forward and let's pray together. Let's find out what it's going to take you to turn from your sin and by faith turn to Christ. Join me as we pray and then we'll sing. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus by the power of the Spirit. We stand under the authority of your word and we believe in your forgiving power. We thank you even now as we still have the taste of the juice and the wafer in our mouths. As we consider it and think on the cost of our own salvation. We pray for those even here today. Father, I pray that you would move in such a way that men and women that are not in Christ today, right now, would trust and come forward. We lift up our one to you. We pray that miraculously, we know you save in so many ways, miraculously you would save all that we've written down. And God, when we walk out of here today as sons and daughters, may our hearts be filled with joy. May you find us faithful this week. May you carry us through and bring us back ready to worship again. We thank you for all of these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You stand, please, we sing together.
standing just as a reminder, a couple of reminders I want to give you. Um, number one, if you're a guest of ours today, we would love, as it's already mentioned from the stage, we would love to get to know you a little bit more. So out in our lobby, uh, under the two large TVs out there, there'll be pastors after the service. We'd love to get to know you a little bit more and answer the questions you may have. Second of all, um, as pastors mentioned this, as Kyle's mentioned this, we have resources in the lobby. If you're praying for that person that you want to see come to know Christ. There's some resources out there that you can pick up that'll help you and guide you through some things, maybe some conversations you need to have with that person. So uh, we're excited about that. Um, also, when you go out, you're going to learn about some opportunities, um, some outreach opportunities we have here at the church. As it's mentioned before, as you saw in the videos, listen, we need a lot of help, and uh, it's a great opportunity to serve our neighbors and our community. So. Um, check out the tables. There'll be people there to answer your questions um, about those outreach opportunities. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we close out our service. Father, we are thankful today to come together to worship, to exalt the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that as a church that you will give us names, the people that we know that don't know Christ that don't have the hope in Christ right now, I pray that you will lay those names on our hearts and that we will write them down and we will pray for those people and that we will have conversations with those people and we will tell them about the hope that we have in Christ. So God, as we go today, I pray your Holy Spirit will lead us and guide us to share the good news of Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen.